Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, we ask your continued guidance from within and from without, reflecting your will within us with nudges and pushes and intuitions and your will outside of us in doors that open unexpectedly. Please continue to be with us as we discern our way forward and the priorities we are called to have. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I uh, reiterate each Sunday and as many if not all of you already know, we have been moving through the book Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. And the book lays out 12 different spiritual disciplines, and uh, there's a chapter dedicated to each. And as always, you're welcome to come to the discussion tonight at 7 uh, as we continue to discuss the book itself. Um, but this Sunday, the theme we're drawing from that book, from one of the chapters, is the theme of worship. The spiritual practice of worship. And you'd think that since we do this spiritual practice together for an hour every Sunday, sometimes more than Sunday, we do some Wednesdays, some Thursdays, Christmas doesn't always come on a Sunday, etc. You think that we'd already be experts and we would come to this text and, and just read things we already know and uh, be reassured. That wasn't really my experience, reading the chapter on worship uh, in the Foster book. Um, and it isn't required reading to understand what's happening today. Um, it's supplemental. But it's interesting. Richard Foster has this habit of kind of introducing a spiritual discipline. He's excited about all 12 of them because he, he wrote a whole book, and that's difficult to do. Uh, so he introduces the spiritual discipline at kind of a basic level. And then by the end of the chapter, he has expanded the spiritual discipline and pushed it kind of to its edges. And so I appreciate this because he gives an introductory level, like this is the basic idea of what worship is. And then by the end of the chapter, he's like every moment and every thought and every action should be suffused with worship for God. And that's how you should live your life. And I've taken multiple multi-day retreats to focus on this. And you're like, wow. That's a lot, okay. It's a little intimidating. But I like that he shows us the first steps on the path, and then he also shows us way down the path, farther ahead, what we might be in store for, or what might be in store for us as we continue with these disciplines, which as always are best understood, probably only understood as practices. So if you read the book, like, ah, that was an interesting book, and then don't practice these things, they don't take root in us, they don't have a chance to change us. Uh, fortunately, worship is going to be something we continue to do, and I hope that we continue to approach it as a spiritual practice, with that intentionality. The first point that Foster makes about worship uh, is reflected in our reading from the Psalms this morning. Uh, that point is that worship, it isn't primarily something we do on our own initiative. Like, we didn't come up with worship. We didn't invent it. Worship is a response to what God has already done and what God is already doing. So if God wasn't doing anything, and if God had never done anything, then worship is a giant waste of time. We should be doing something else even with our hour on a Sunday. But worship begins as a response to God. God has done something in my life, in someone else's life, and I saw in the past, and I've learned about, and I have to respond to this in some way, and that response is worship. So we are in worship responding to God. And as we follow along with the path that, that Foster lays out, and that Scripture does as well, then that response to God, this idea that 
that we are to respond to what God is already doing carries us through to other parts of our life. It isn't, we don't just respond to God for an hour on Sunday, you know, punch our clock and then walk out and go do other stuff. Ideally, it changes our view of how we use our time every day. Like, what if every day was a response to God in some way? Would that drastically change what your day is like? Possibly. Is it worth making that change? It's worth thinking about, I think. And so as this idea and this discipline of worship moves out into other parts of our life, it also absorbs and incorporates other spiritual disciplines. So even Foster talks about this. As he's talking about worship, he's also talking about prayer, one of the disciplines we've read about. He talks about meditation. He talks about fasting and other spiritual disciplines caught up in this idea of worship. In some ways, worship is kind of a combo discipline. Like it incorporates multiple other spiritual disciplines. And sometimes it's really helpful to compartmentalize. Because if you look at the various spiritual disciplines, they stick to each other and they pull each other in. And they, they work together really well. But sometimes it helps to, to pull one apart and look at it by itself. And study it by itself. It's kind of like if you're learning to be an artist, you take one technique and you practice that one technique until you're very good at it. But that doesn't mean you could do that one technique for the rest of your life and be a good artist. You need to have the other techniques. And at some point, you pull them together and you begin using them in tandem and using them in parallel to create things you couldn't have created using one technique at a time. Spiritual disciplines are like that. You can focus on one, get a good idea of how it works, what it feels like, how to do it. But you don't just focus on that narrow-mindedly forever. It'll begin to pull in other disciplines as well. I mean, think of this. In, in, in the spiritual discipline of worship, as we practice it on a Sunday, we pray, we sing, we confess, we celebrate, we meditate, we listen, we study. All in the space of an hour, we've covered like half of Foster's chapters. And that's kind of the nature of worship that I'm talking about. It pulls in other disciplines. I would even say I was reading the chapter and I was thinking what is distinctive about worship itself. Like, can we pull it aside, cut off from the other spiritual disciplines, and say much about it? And I actually don't know that we can. I'm not sure in the chapter Foster gives us a, like, this is what worship is by itself. In the way you could say that fasting by itself is a thing. You abstain from food for a period of time that is fasting. But how would you worship only and not practice these other disciplines? I don't think he gives us an answer. If you disagree, you're welcome to talk to me about it uh, at 7 o'clock over Zoom. But the way that Foster presents worship and conceptualizes it, there are two key ideas that tell us that we're engaged in worship. One, I already talked about, that worship is a response to God. If we're responding to God, there's a good chance we're worshiping. And the second key is that worship moves us and changes us. Maybe just a little bit. Sometimes we hope maybe a lot. So that we are a little bit different and so that we go out into the world and we do things a little bit differently. So worship is a response to God and worship changes and moves us. A reading from John, I think, is a relatively well-known one. For many of you, it's probably not the first time you've heard this story of Mary and Martha. It's a classic for a number of reasons, one being it's one of the minority of stories that feature women. And so it kind of stands out when we read. It's like, oh, some main characters who are women, what are they up to? This is interesting. And so you have Martha who is serving, 
and you have Mary, who has this, at 300 denarii, this enormous amount of perfume. Like, this is 300 days of pay worth of perfume. So, four, or five sixths of what you make all year, take that amount of money and spend it all on a container of perfume. And imagine how much that perfume would cost. So it's this huge sacrifice that Mary makes. And she anoints Jesus with this perfume and the fragrance fills the room. I love that image. In the ancient church, in the writings of the first Christians, prayer was said to raise a fragrance that God could smell. So praying and singing and, and, and speaking the Psalms aloud was like a delicious fragrance that God reveled in. The Old Testament tells us about how God could smell sacrifices, and it was like smelling a cookout or a barbecue down the street. You're just like, oh, someone's having a really good lunch over there. <laughs> That's what it's like for God. God's like, oh, savory, savory worship. And so Mary makes this sacrifice, and we have Judas criticizing her, and the author of John, of course, knows the story of Judas, isn't going to be kind to him. Uh, we have these parenthetical comments about, he, you know, he didn't really care about the poor. He just wanted to, you know, continue embezzling money from the, the communal uh, cash that the disciples had. But I looked at this and I thought, we also know the story of Judas, but what if we gave this criticism the benefit of the doubt? Because people who aren't Judas, who aren't embezzling traitors, bring up this kind of concern all the time in good faith. We call it stewardship. When we look at the resources that we have, and we try to figure out the best way to use them, what is most meaningful with our limited funds, our limited energy, our limited time, and you could criticize a use of those resources and not be a Judas. Or you could use a lot of resources, but not have the mindset or the, the heart that Mary had. And I thought it was interesting to look at this. Like, sometimes this criticism is obviously correct. So if someone looks at a preacher and they have a private jet, do they need the private jet? Obviously no. <laughs> You could obviously not have a private jet, and you could take all that money and do a lot of good with it. Right? That's easy. Or you look at, you know, someone has, a preacher has a mansion. A 25-room, 27-bathroom mansion in the hills of California. Do you need that? Is that glorifying God? I think obviously no. You could sell that mansion, live in a smaller mansion, and put all that money toward the poor. That would be the right thing to do. And then there's some borderline cases, like what about all the art that the Vatican has? The Vatican in Rome has immeasurable billions of dollars worth of artworks. And the Vatican functions as a place for those things to be enjoyed and kept safe. And you can go to the Vatican and see them and be moved and amazed. But if they sold all that artwork, they could dig a lot of wells. They could feed a lot of hungry people. So how, how do you balance that? To me, that's kind of in the middle. And then there's some cases where an expenditure is a little bit lavish, but it's, it's right. It's a way to honor God. It's a way to worship. And it's appropriate. And this is harder than it's presented in the text from John. And it comes back to worship because it's about how do we worship? How do we worship God best? The harshest view on one side, you could say everything is a waste unless it's directly related to serving the poor. And so we should sell our building and our organ and our musical instruments and all the staff should be volunteers and we should meet in the park and then all that money we should give to the poor. That's a harsh way of putting it. Clearly, it isn't something we've done. Is that really the best? I'm not sure. We still have the story of Mary, and Jesus approves of what she did. So she did the right thing. And then the most lenient view would be something like, what, 
something is too good for God? You think God isn't worthy of being worshipped in a giant golden cathedral with crystal windows and multiple private jets covered in gold for every pastor? What, is it too good for God? You want to insult God with a paltry second-hand private jet? What, like, what, what are you even talking about? Right, so we have, we, have, we have some ends that I don't like, <laughs> that don't ring true, and we're all somewhere in the middle. That yes, we should use our resources to help the poor and not be extravagant. But the kingdom of God is not efficient. Worship is not efficient. This is, there's not a very good return on investment. There's the ROI in worship is very low. And that is not why we are here. So there has to be some balance between the extravagance and the generosity. And honestly, we just have to discern that. We have to figure that out for ourselves and different communities. We'll do that in different ways. You're going to have the Vatican on one end of the spectrum. And you're going to have people meeting in the park on the other end of the spectrum. And all of them can worship God. And we're somewhere in the midst of all that. There is a point at which the extravagance becomes a betrayal. The way that Judas was a traitor, uh, that extravagance could also be a betrayal. But it isn't clear where that line is. That waste, quote unquote, of perfume was Mary's heartfelt act of worship. And Jesus said, that was the right thing to do. I won't be here forever. Worship me in this way while you can. Worship me in other ways when I'm gone. And the path between those extremes is ours to discern at each point. Returning to talk about worship directly. The interesting thing to me is that as Foster presents worship as potentially being anything in life, like Foster presents a life that is a continual act of worship. So if that's possible, then worship can be anything. Meaning worship can be whatever, whatever we need it to be. Worship can be whatever moves us, whatever changes us, and whatever is a, a, an honest response to God. And even in the Presbyterian Church, because most of what we do here is tradition and habit. Like the Book of Order doesn't, that's our constitution, it doesn't tell us to worship this way. Even though almost every Presbyterian Church I've been to does have some version of this service. We don't have to. This is tradition, this is habit. We could change almost everything about worship and still be perfectly legitimate. There are only a few things worship has to have. I'll let you know, because I encourage you to think about this going forward. This sermon was largely written in the lounge of a hotel while I was driving my uncle back from Memphis. So I'm leaving this one open at the end for you. A worship service has, must be open to anyone. As long as you're here and you're willing, you're not a danger, you're not a threat. As long as you're here with the intent to worship, you're welcome, period. And so we have to make that clear as part of a worship service. There has to be an opening, there has to be a welcome. That is a requirement, okay? A worship service must include a confession of sin. And we're not going to be mean, we're not going to leave you hanging. We're also going to have an assurance of pardon. The purpose of that isn't cheap grace. The purpose of that is so the things that stand between us and God, we set them aside for a while. Whatever sins are separating us from God, we put them aside or we get past them if we can so that we're able to worship. The idea is if you're still hung up on what you've done, you're not going to be really able to worship. So there must be a confession and there must be an assurance for a Presbyterian worship service at least. 
There must be the proclamation of the word. So that could be a reading from the Bible. It could be a song. It could be dance. It could be visual art. It could be a sermon. Normally it is. But at the center of the service, we encounter the word of God. In whatever way works best. Whatever way is most effective. And then after that, there must be a time when we can respond to the Word of God. It doesn't just sit there for us to enjoy and congratulate ourselves. There must be a time to respond. So that response could be Holy Communion. It could be an offering. It could be a, a recommitment. Our joys and concerns are a response to the Word of God. And then last, for a worship service, there must be some kind of sending at the end. We don't just end, you know, turn the lights off, drop the mic, walk out. The idea is that we have been moved and changed and we're sent out into the world to be, God willing, a little bit different and a little bit better. But given those five basic requirements, there's a lot we could do. There's a lot we could do with that form, with that basic shape. And as you leave today, I hope you spend time thinking about that, about other ways that we could worship God in addition to this way, or changes we could make to what we do on Sunday. If Foster encourages us to think of worship as potentially being everything in life, and that also means in a way that worship could be anything. Anything that is a response to God, anything that moves and changes us, could be worship. And so I invite you to look inward, to think and to consider and to remember what has moved you in the past. What has changed you over the course of your life? What brings you closer to God? And as we go forward, I want to hear about this. I want us to talk about it. Because those are the priorities that we should have when we are deciding how to worship. Amen.